Usman, thank you very much. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Um, it's actually 8 o'clock here in the U.S., uh, I think 6 p.m. in Pakistan. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for uh, for having me here. Uh, I've attended a few of these sessions, um, and it is an honor and a privilege to be here amongst, uh, amongst all you guys. Uh, this is, I think, a great uh, educational effort. Um, and, uh, and I think you and your team, along with Dr. Athar, are doing a, a fantastic job uh, putting this together. So yeah, so thanks for having me here. We'll just dive right into it. Uh, have some uh, interesting things to show, uh, maybe some controversial stuff as well. Uh, and uh, I would be excited to see what the audience has to uh, say about this uh, uh, data and presentation, and then we'll go from there. So um, as Osman mentioned, uh, topic for today is uh, neurovascular implications in neuro-oncological surgery. Um, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Farhan Siddiq, I think about a year ago, did present uh, on a similar topic, uh, but that was geared more towards um, endovascular embolization for tumors. Uh, and I'm going to come and uh, take on this topic from a slightly different angle, uh, more so trying to, uh, uh, in the hope of breaking some myths and see if uh, the envelope can be pushed in a different direction and can be applied across different specialties. Um, <clears throat> so I have no disclosures. So essentially, what we're going to try to do today here is try to merge the uh, neuro-oncological surgery or tumor surgery with the neuro-endovascular uh, realm of things. So that has been more famously now coined as interventional uh, neuro-oncology or endovascular neuro-oncology rather. So um, let's see what that entails. Uh, so, you know, we're just going to briefly discuss the role of interventional uh, neuro-oncology or endovascular neurosurgery with, with tumors. Uh, and its role in extraaxial and intraaxial tumors, head and neck, uh, head and neck cancers, and skull-based tumors, uh, as well as role of uh, uh, you know cerebral revascularization when dealing with complex uh, cranial pathologies, uh, role in spinal oncology, and then the future directions. Again, as I said, some of the some of the uh, material here might be might have been discussed in the previous session, but. Uh, very quickly, we'll just move on to some of the things that have not been discussed, I believe, here, but uh, might be of some interest to most of the attendees. So, you know, there's a lot of debate and the jury is still out about uh, how much uh, endovascular expertise helps with uh, uh, extra axial tumors. Um, this topic has been uh, beaten to death across several sessions. Um, you know, uh, a lot of people have presented. Uh, data has been out there. Uh, and. Uh, at the end of the day, I think a lot of surgeons go with their experience, with their anecdotal evidence about whether embolization helps or not. Um, and as I have progressed through my career, I have unfortunately or fortunately taken different stance on it as my um, training and, and uh, experience have dictated. So just, uh, you know, quickly to just, we're going to show this uh, uh, patient case here. This is a 70-year-old gentleman that actually I did recently. I uh, have this like uh, pretty large parasitical parafall scene, uh, what turned out to be a grade two uh, meningioma. And uh, these are the uh, axial MRI. You can see some flow voids in there. This is a T2 axial section. And most surgeons would probably, uh, most experienced surgeons would probably not worry about doing endovascular embolization in this one. But given its proximity to the superior sagittal sinus, um, um, I just wanted to see what the superior size of sinus looked like and what the the uh, the the blood pattern was or this blood supply pattern was. And as you can see here, I'm sorry that these angiograms might move a little quickly, so I'll try to play them a couple of times so the audience can um, catch up with these. But uh, here you can see a lot of blood supply from the distal ACA. There's a uh, it's mostly peel blush. Those are the peel branches that are supplying. Uh, this tumor right here. And then you can see a large, what is an anterior falcine artery coming off the ophthalmic artery supplying the tumor. Um, and it's kind of important to know uh, these, uh, this anatomy uh, and understand as a, as a, even as a neurosurgeon, what, what can or cannot be embolized. So just generally speaking, for instance, these branches are, are probably not the best to embolize because um, you can get into these parent vessels with a microcatheter but then it is quite likely like, uh, because some of these are emphasized vessels and they give out twigs that supply the tumor. And in the process of embolizing, you can essentially sacrifice the parent vessels and cause a huge stroke. So definitely not something 
um, that is viable, especially you know a tumor that is on the convexity and can be easily controlled. Um, similarly, uh, this anterior falsing, as you can see, it's quite tortuous. So getting distal into this artery is exceedingly challenging, uh, and you can put the ophthalmic artery at risk and cause blindness. So not something that would be uh, wise to do here. Uh, but at least kind of gives you the idea about. Uh, oops, sorry, about the uh, the uh, the pattern of the blood supply. But then also you can also notice that the anterior part of the superior side of the sinus is also occluded, and then gives you an idea about the uh, venous uh, drainage in that area of the brain. Uh, this is uh, the AP view on the left IC injection and sort of similar findings. You can see the ACA being pushed over to the right. The tumor does extend from the left to the right side. Uh, a lot of pale blush primarily from the ACA vessels, the big anterior falcine artery that we uh, saw, which right in the middle right here. Uh, so no identifiable targets to embolize per se, but you can get an idea from the blush that this is going to be moderately vascular if not, if not very um, severely hypervascular. So this would be a right EC injection. You can see this bright, pretty large and uh, middle meningeal artery that comes off the top towards the midline and then supplies the tumor blush right here. Um, and you know, so that served as a decent identifiable target that uh, that uh, we were able to embolize um, uh, for uh, for. Uh, uh, for preoperative embolization. And then this is the left uh, middle meningeal, selective injection of a middle meningeal artery. And you can see, um, I'm sorry, I don't think I've put up a left uh, external carotid artery injection, but this is the left middle meningeal that you can see that's again coming over the top and, and providing some of the tumor blush. Again, as I said, most experienced surgeons would probably not even care about the embol embolizing uh, uh, this much. Um, and I think data is pretty uh, split on whether even this amount of embolization is going to help or not. But the, but the idea here is if, you, if somebody does decide to embolize, the important thing is to make sure that the particles or the embolic material penetrates deep into the tumor. Embolizing the arteries back all the way here proximally is not going to serve the purpose. Um, so, so the idea is to try to get your catheter as distal as possible towards the tumor and then really make sure that there's good penetration of the embolic material um, into the tumor. Again, uh, you know, uh, although this is just a meningioma, but uh, if you have the expertise to perform embolization, and let's say if this was not a meningioma, but let's say a hemangiopericytoma, which are much more uh, bloody, then embolization could be really critical in those, uh, in those cases. <clears throat> um, and also like this is a vertebral artery. So when you do an angiogram, obviously you do the, you, you, you inject all the six vessels um or five vessels five vessels rather and so you can also see like there are these distinct vessels that are coming from the pca that are supplying the posterior aspect of the tumor so something to keep in mind uh, when operating on these tumors uh, again you know something that's very very diminutive in size cannot be easily embolized and, and the risk is is definitely outweighed by the benefits uh, so this is not something that you know we did not embolize uh, these vessels um certainly because they could be easily controlled during surgery. Once again, you can see the anterior part of the superior sidal sinus is, is occluded. So, you know, we, we embolized bilateral middle meningeal arteries, we got a decent embolization, but again, the surgery wasn't terribly difficult and got a decent resection. Um, so just moving on. So I think that's something that, that Dr. Farhan Siddhi had, had discussed in his talk. Uh, I'm going to just shift gears about some different tumors here. So this is a, another lady that presented with significant worsening vision in the right eye and had presented with this tumor right here, as you can see. Um, within the orbit. Uh, so she was sent to us uh, by our ophthalmology colleagues. Um, and obviously they were not sure if they're dealing with a hemangioma or, um, or any kind of vascular tumor, given it's an enhancement pattern. Um, they wanted to like do an angiogram and assist with possible embolization. Um, she had significant uh, vision worsening. Her uh, um, ocular examination, including retinal nerve fiber layer thickness and other testing, uh, you know, testing of papilledema showed that she has severe, almost irreversible damage to her retina. So um, uh, a lot of surgery was done to preserve whatever minimal vision she had, but then also uh, for uh, cosmetic purposes, because as you can see that the, the eye was essentially like bulging out of the orbit uh, and cosmetically just not appropriate. So this is the right IC injection. It's a lateral view and you can see significant blush in the, uh, of, the of the tumor right here, primarily supplied all by the 
um, of the amic artery right here. And you know, decent amount of blush uh, that you can you can see. Again, not, not nothing horrendous, but we had after we, we saw this, we had an extensive discussion with the patient and, and the, uh, the operating surgeon, and both were very interested in proceeding with embolization. Um, so uh, you know, now with the small microcatheters that we have available, you can actually get the catheter into the ophthalmic artery um, and do a selective microinjection, uh, which is what you see here. So it essentially, kind of outlines the tumor and the blush, and then we proceeded to like um, inject onyx, which is a liquid embolic, for uh, 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 for preoperative embolization, and this was the final result right here. Now, as you see, you can see, the onyx cast pretty much in the entire ophthalmic artery right here uh, after the embolization was completed. Same thing here. So sort of deep, nice deep penetration into the uh, feeding vessels. Uh, but obviously, as you can expect, when she woke up, whatever vision she had remaining was pretty much gone because the small uh, central retinal artery sometimes that you cannot see. Uh, I mean, most of the times you will see normal angiograms, but the reason you don't see in these um, in this angiogram is because uh, all the vessels are parasitized by the tumor. So, um, I mean, maybe we helped the surgeon, but we certainly did not help the patient. Uh, so if there was any chances of her saving any vision after the tumor removal were essentially sacrificed. So showing this case essentially to show that, you know, um, sometimes you can be aggressive with these embolizations, but you got to take into consideration that there are definitely side effects um, or downsides to it. And obviously, uh, you know, um, the other complication that could have happened, which fortunately did not, is the onyx could have easily reflexed into the internal carotid artery and then go distally and cause an MCS stroke. So um, I've, thankfully it hasn't happened to me, but I've seen this happen. So have to be very careful about that. So now moving on to some intraaxial tumors. Um, again, in the last session- Akil, what was the path? Akil, what was the path here? Uh, it was a hemangioma. Hemangioma. Yeah. So cavernous hemangioma or? Cavernous hemangioma, exactly. Hmm. They, were, they were more worried about this being an orbital AVM. Um, and that's why, that's why they requested this um, angiogram and embolization. Uh, but as you can see that there was no shunting in the lesion. And, and you know, um, I think this thing actually has been growing for about four to five years and the patient just refused to uh, seek any uh, treatment for this until like, you know, she was almost blind in that eye. What is the concern, Umar? Where, where do you ask that question particularly? Uh, it's, it's just interesting, um, embolizing um, a cavernoma. It's just, just interesting. Yeah. Well, the thing is, we obviously did not know it was a cavernoma until it was resected. Um, the ophthalmology, uh, the eye surgeons uh, sort of uh, refused to accept the, the radiology read that this is a cavernoma. Uh, I think they were bent on saying that this is more of a some kind of a vascular lesion that um, that they were just very uh, reluctant to touch without us being embolizing it. Right. And so, so during during um, during your angiogram, um, mm -hmm. I can go back you, to it. Did you uh, did you think that this was a vascular lesion, like a high, highly shunting vascular lesion? No, I mean, as you can see, there's not there's not a lot of shunting. You can just see that this is a probably a moderately vascular tumor, but def definitely not. So as I said, initially they were thinking this could be like a malformation. This was definitely not a malformation, right? Uh, it is just a big um, cavernous hemangioma. It has parasitized a lot of vessels. Um, personally speaking, I mean, I, if I had to do this, uh, I would not have worried about embolizing it because, again, it's superficial. Uh, their concern was the, the, of, the ophthalmic artery is obviously like, you know, the last thing that they'll see because uh, the way they're approaching this tumor uh, from more of a lateral orbitotomy. Um, but uh, so, yeah, so it wasn't like, you know, the patient, patient was exsanguinate resecting this tumor. Um, mm. So, yeah, personally speaking, if I had to do this, I'm not so sure if I had uh, bothered to, um, to do it. As I said, you know, embolizing through the ophthalmic artery is always pretty risky. I think one of the reasons we, we decided to do it is because... Um, as the ophthalmologist said, that her vision was essentially like, you know, non-serviceable anymore. Um, so we knew that, you know, once we're done with this, there's quite likelihood that whatever motion per, uh, perception she had, that will also just, or light perception she had will also go away. And, you know, it rightfully did because uh, the onyx and uh, the DMSO probably went into the central retinal artery. There's no way to protect that. So I, that's why I always, uh, I mean, I'm not a big fan of embolizing tumors through 
um, through the ophthalmic artery. You know, sometimes when patients will come to us with olfactory groove meningiomas, you know, those are being supplied with the ethmoidals. Uh, going through the ophthalmic is just not, uh, I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's way too aggressive uh, for, the, for the benefits that you get. No, thank you so much for this comment. That's exactly what I wanted the audience to hear from you as well. This is um, rather unusual, and I'm, I'm glad you, uh, you pointed that out. Thank you. Yeah, no, sorry to, but, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, no, no. Thank you for interrupting. I, I, think, I think this was great. I think this is the good discussion that we should have every time. Yeah, this is. Uh, I mean, as I said, this is a very unusual case. Um, uh, you know, as I said, this this took a lot of discussions back and forth. And my biggest concern was not even when we when we embolized this through the onyx um, uh, through the ophthalmic artery. My biggest concern wasn't even her losing her vision because. The eye, as I said, the the ophthalmology team was like, you know, they're like, yeah, by the time we're done with this, she's probably going to lose her vision, you know, just by surgical manipulation. Uh, my biggest concern was onyx refluxing into the ICA and then causing an MCA stroke because that would have been disastrous. And 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 trust me, I've seen that happen, and and it's not it's not pretty because once the onyx goes distal, trying to get it out with the stent reverse and 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 aspiration catheters is is a real challenge and can cause major deficits. So yeah, mm -hmm. so the, you, know, you always have to keep risk benefit profile in your mind. But I just wanted to throw this out there just for the same reason. I I, I wanted somebody to pounce on this. So I'm glad Omar you did. <laughs> How could you not? <laughs> How could you not? Exactly. Well, there's some more stuff coming up. So yes, I'm I'm ready to uh, to take some more hits. Uh, it's but, not it's uh, not a hit. Don't take it as a hit. Uh, please. This is, this oh, no, no 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 no. I'm. I'm, yeah, no, I know, I know. All right, we'll we'll just keep moving on. It's uh, it's I, I'm looking for some uh, exciting discussions here because, uh, as I said, we're trying to marry those two fields, and and you know, there's all a lot of uh, built-in perceptions from everybody, but uh, you know, it's that's how you push the boundaries, I guess. Right. So I think I don't know if uh, most of you remember the last time this discussion happened with with Farhan in his last talk. Uh, Dr. Juma actually um, uh, talked about embolizing hemangioblastomas, uh, and I fortunately, when I was going through my case archives, I actually did find a patient. Who had this posterior fossa hemangioblastoma who had previously gone undergone resection of, of a supratentorial hemangioblastoma and so we knew that this this was hemangioblastoma so this was um taken for an angiogram but intent to embolize and as you can see this is a right ica injection right here and you can see a big beefy minimal hypophyseal trunk right here um that's uh that's supplying the tumor and so uh you know, I mean, again, the question is, is it worth doing it? So, so those are some of the things that you learn in your training, right? So uh, we, we, we spend a considerable amount of time trying to get into this MHT. The next images basically show that there's a balloon that's inflated within the ICA um, because as you can see that the, the origin of the MHT is quite tortuous. Uh, let me show another picture right here. So MHT is originating right here from the posterior part of the cavernous ICA. And so the catheter would just not track over this wire and obviously you don't want to start embolizing from here because you're so close to the ICA here so you want to be at least like this far deep so that if there's any reflux of any embolic material you wouldn't get it into the ICA but despite doing all our uh you know acrobats here by inflating the balloon and trying to push this catheter in it, this was just not possible so but we did a external injection and uh um, as you can see on the ECA you have a middle meningeal artery that goes into it and there's some transosseous branches from the occipital or probably posterior auricular that are, that are supplying this tumor. So uh, selecting those and embolizing through those um, was a much easier task. This is a micro injection through the middle meningeal artery right here. And you know, there's a decent blood blush uh, on this injection. So, and this was easy enough to embolize. So we were able to get our catheters distally and then embolize it. So, so that takes us to this next question, right? Uh, I mean, we talk about, uh, a lot of people have talked about role of endovascular embolization, devascularization, delivery of intraarterial chemotherapeutic drugs and high-grade gliomas. Um, and essentially like there are three uh, big uh, pointers uh, when you're talking about endovascular treatment of gliomas. Now this is, I'm, 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 I'm treading mm -hmm. into treacherous waters here and, and I have Dr. Athar and, and Umar and I'm sure a few more uh, uh, glioma surgeons who are probably going to, uh, you know, disagree with me, but but just hear me out and then we'll we'll take the discussion later on. But essentially, uh, you know, those are three big uh, components, right? So endovascular embolization and devascularization of the tumor, selective intraarterial drug delivery, and then disruption of blood-brain barrier because we want to get the drug to the tumor. 
Um, and I'm sure most of you are aware there has been a lot of work that has been done. Uh, people have tried to inject all sorts of chemotherapeutic agents that are essentially otherwise used systemically, including, you know, cisplatin, carboplatin, uh, etoposide, so on and so forth. And the results, unfortunately, have been uh, have been disappointing. I think none of them have been reliably shown to have any increased survival or even tumor control rate. Um, right here, you can see like PCNU and all that stuff have been injected. And so there's, there's been a plethora of evidence uh, that intraarterial drug treatment uh, for high-grade gliomas or GVMs uh, does not work. However, uh, I think most of this work was done uh, primarily in the earlier times where we were not able to get very distal access or what we call a super selective, um, um, uh, super selective injections of, um, of those uh, uh, distal vessels. So most of these drugs were being injected into, into the, either the ICA or into the vertebral arteries. They were not into the M3, M4s or A3, A4 vessels where you can get really distal, get past all the eloquent or normal tissue uh, and just perfuse uh, just the tumor and not the surrounding brain because that's where most of the neurotoxicity was coming from. So, you know, as I said, the, the pitfalls in all these studies were essentially that there was non-selective infusion, there's a lot of neurotoxicity and, and everybody was using these systemic chemo chemotherapeutic agents that were otherwise being injected um, intravenously. And so more recently, the group out of MD Anderson, out of uh, Sloan Kettering, uh, the group out of uh, uh, New York and Lenox Hill with uh, John Brockovar and, uh, and David Langer, uh, and then Peter Kan more recently, they, they have published more recent uh, papers, uh, primarily in the, uh, the, uh, in the journals of neurointerventional surgery, uh, about talking about the endovascular selective and then super selective infusion of the targeted biological therapy. So not just any chemotherapeutic agents, but actually biological agents uh, to control these tumors. Again, this is, this is a very pre preliminary work. Obviously it's definitely not streamlined. It has not been uh, a, a part of guidelines or I don't think anybody is actually doing it beyond experimental level. Uh, but what has changed in the last uh, few years that has prompted people to come back to this um, uh, you know, as I said, we now have these really small uh, uh, caliber microcatheters that can enable us to do really super selective injection and get really distal into the uh, into the vascular tree. Uh, there's something called spatial dose fractionation, which is basically selecting all these small little pedicles that might be perfusing the tumor, and then figuring out which pedicles are primarily supplying majority of the blood supply to the tumor, and then adjusting the dose that you give uh, of any biologic. Um, through those pedicles in relevance to the supply of the tumor, to the supply of, to the blood supply to the tumor. Um, also, uh, when administering those drugs, uh, these folks have talked about uh, what's called as an infusion and not an injection. So you do a very slow pulsatile infusion, uh, which is about 0.2 to 0.4 ml per minute, uh, and you try to match the laminar flow, which essentially, to some extent, ensures a deeper penetration of whatever. Uh, drug that you're trying to inject into the tumor. Um, and then there's a lot of talk about how to disrupt the blood brain barrier and the blood tumor barrier, uh, because we all know one of the biggest reasons that we are limited by, you know, to have an effective chemotherapy for these tumors is because the blood brain barrier is in the way. So they want to try to break open those barriers. For the longest time, people have used diuretics and mannitol to open those uh, tight junctions, but now more recently focus ultrasound where you agitate those micro bubbles um, cause a, a physical disruption, uh, a temporary physical disruption of the blood-brain barrier to, to be able to, um, you know, allow these uh, uh, agents, be it biologics or chemotherapeutic agents, to get into the tumor. Um, and as I said, you know, the biological therapies. So essentially, this is a picture from their most recent paper from 2021, where they're trying to get MRI studies, uh, a cone beam CT, an angiogram, and then essentially merging all those studies together um, and then just trying to just figure out where is the, the highest amount of uh, tumor perfusion, which vessels are supplying most of the blood, um, creating color maps from that, and then essentially targeting those areas and, and, and uh, injecting an, uh, uh, a proportionate amount of dose of whatever biologic uh, needs to be, uh, needs to be uh, injected in those areas. Again, very preliminary, uh, I think, but I think it's exciting time because you know, this is very similar to when uh, initial stroke studies came out uh, and uh, showed that the thrombectomy does not work and thrombectomy fell out of favor before 
uh, all those trials got revitalized and reinvigorated. And then essentially now we show that thrombectomy is as useful as giving antibiotics to a septic patient. So I think there's definitely hope here. Uh, obviously we're dealing with a much bigger beast. Uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in delivering not just chemotherapeutic agents, but more like viral vectors, micro RNAs, um, uh, and those sort of vehicles rather than just simply, uh, you know, temozolomide or, or uh, Avastin. So sort of a pictorial depiction that we're talking about. So, the, you know, uh, in their paper, they proposed essentially putting these, uh, uh, these agents uh, into some kind of a carrier, some kind of a vehicle. So it could be mitochondrial RNAs or oncolytic viruses. You put them in, in these exosomes uh, or micelles and then essentially uh, do your best to disrupt the blood-brain barrier uh, so as to achieve uh, deeper penetration into these tumors. Now, will this, will this hold a key towards uh, improved survival uh, and, and, and tumor regression? We don't know, but I think this, this is definitely somewhere where, uh, where breakthrough is. And I think that's where neurointerventional oncology gets very, uh, very exciting. Uh, but, you know, on this, in the same realm, while we're talking about these interaxial tumors, where intraarterial chemotherapy has worked is, is retinoblastomas. Now, traditionally, retinoblastomas might not be considered intraaxial tumors, but essentially they're from the neuroepithelium from the retina. Um, and, and, and we see quite a few of these here at Emory. Um, you know, uh, they're one of the more common ocular tumors in kids, you know, cause the rapid blindness. Only treatment options back in the day before, I think, 2005, 2008 was, uh, was enucleation. Uh, but then Abramson out of Memorial Sloan Kettering came up with a great treatment regimen with these three drugs, uh, with melphalan, carboplatin, and topotecan. And then you give them over several sessions. Um, and it causes significant regression of the tumor. And then as you can see, the 10-year ocular survival rate can be as high as 92%. So you prevent uh, enucleation in those kids. So it's, it's revolutionary because again, as I said, with these smaller microcatheters, you can actually select the ophthalmic artery. So this is what you do. Um, you know, uh, you have a retinoblastoma tumor here, as you can see. Um, and this is pre-treatment. Uh, pre Microcatheter can actually sit into the ophthalmic artery. So this is the ICA right here. You can see a, a ghost of it. Once you get it reliably into the ophthalmic artery, you inject these three drugs very slowly into the, uh, into the uh, eye. Um, and then as you can see here, uh, this is a picture from the landmark paper from, uh, uh, that Abramson published back in uh, 2010 after they had uh, given this medication to approximately 500 patients. Um, and you can see the response to the tumor is like just remarkable. You go from a full-fledged retinoblastoma to a calcified remnant. You can see on this beta scan ultrasound images that this thing has completely like gone down. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is, uh, this is uh, um, uh, so this is basically one indication that intraarterial chemotherapy can work. Now, obviously the blood retina barrier is like nine, 10 times more porous than the blood brain or the blood tumor barrier, but hey, you know, at least this is a start. So I, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that I think the key to treatment of, of GBMs hopefully lies somewhere um, uh, in the marriage of uh, neuro-oncology and, uh, and neurovascular or neuroendovascular uh, 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 disciplines. Uh, just quickly moving on, uh, you know, when you, are, when you are trained in endovascular uh, surgery, you can obviously help different specialties. So, uh, you know, when you're talking about head and neck cancer, skull-based tumors, or working with ENT colleagues, there's a lot of time where we can help these guys. So essentially, you know, quick example of this patient with bilateral carotid body tumors, um, was sent to us by an ENT colleague. They were trying to resect this one uh, bigger tumor on the left side. Um, and so, yeah, so we were able to essentially perform an angiogram. You can see the left external carotid injection, uh, large tumor, a lot of tumor blush. They're fairly, these are probably one of the more hypervascular tumors that, that, you, can, uh, that you can see in your career. Uh, and uh, therefore embolizing these tumors is, uh, is, is very, uh, as you can see the, the, the I'm sorry if I, skip past through it, but you can see a lot of blush before. And uh, once these will embolize primarily through ascending pharyngeal arteries and the posterior auricular, uh, there's significant re reduction in blush. And at the same time, sometimes the ENT surgeon says, hey, can you do a balloon test occlusion? Because uh, they, uh, there might be a risk of, you know, carotid artery damage or sacrifice. Uh, then you can perform balloon test occlusion too, which we'll talk about really quickly uh, as we move forward. Uh, in the same realm, this is a different patient. He had a significant uh, parapharyngeal cancer, and then he came to the hospital after losing like two liters of blood within five minutes while he was off out shopping with his wife. Uh, so they had got control by packing his mouth and nose because he already had a, uh, uh, a previous tracheostomy from his previous treatments. But you can see this like very nasty 
uh, essentially what's a pseudo aneurysm in the ophthalmic segment or just the distal cavernous segment of the ICA. So this is what he bled from. Um, so, you know, back in the days, you, would, you can just, uh, the only option would be, you know, to surgically ligate the ICA, but that would be pretty challenging because you cannot just like shut the ICA in the neck because there would be a lot of retrograde flow uh, from distally that will feed into the aneurysm. Um, but fortunately, what we were able to do is do a, a balloon test occlusion of the left artery. So this is the right ICA injection, the same patient. As you can see, there's a pretty robust um, anterior communicating artery, sorry, right here. So you can see a good filling of the ACA territory. Th that gives us a good sense of whether this patient will tolerate uh, occlusion of the left ICA. Um, because, you know, there's a, there's a pretty big chance that you can occlude somebody's ICA and they'll, they'll end up having either a stroke or significant hypoperfusion syndrome. So I just want to take a, a couple of minutes to talk about BTO because that's something that is very relevant in the realm of uh, uh, neurovascular and neuro-oncology because if, if there's any time you're suspecting that the carotid artery has to be sacrificed, uh, it's important to know um, what a balloon test occlusion entails. Um, if, if a tumor involves, let's say, a, 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 you know, a, a communicating segment of the ICA where the PCOM and the anterior coronal artery or even the MCO, the ACA is involved, BTO is not going to be helpful. So sometimes we will get some requests from community neurosurgeons where they'll say, well, this is a big sphenoid wing meningioma and can you do a BTO? Well, it's very hard for us to tell them that BTO is not going to help you because you cannot balloon test occlude uh, into your choroidal artery. If you lose that artery, you will get a stroke. There's there's literally no um, no reason to do a BTO. Um, but if if there is an involvement of uh, proximal segments of the ICA, so cervical or petrous or even cavernous, uh, and somebody is suspecting to to resect those uh, resect that artery and occlude it completely, then yes, then BTO is exceedingly uh, helpful. So essentially, the way you do it is you get basically get bilateral femoral or radial access. You do a, an angiogram of the of the uh, of the artery in question. And then you put a compliant balloon in the petrous ICA. And the reason you put it in the petrous ICA is because the artery is encased by bone. You hopefully cannot overinflate and dissect or injure or blow out the artery. And then you put the second catheter in the contralateral ICA. Uh, you give a lot of heparin because if you're in, in, inflating the balloon for a good 20, 30 minutes, the blood's going to be stagnant and you got, it's going to form clots. So one of the biggest problems with BTOs, um, there's a good 5 7% chance that you inflate the balloon, cause stasis of the blood, don't heparinize them aggressively, and they form clots that can go distally and cause a stroke. So, you know, so you have to be like, you have to, so we, in our shop, we uh, measure ACTs, activated clotting time, and we try to keep it above 300. So you keep them significantly heparinized. And then you do the angiogram on the side where the balloon is uh, inflated. So make sure that your balloon is really occluding all the blood flow. And then you do the angiograms on the contralateral side, as well as the vertebral artery to see the collateral flow. Um, again, at Emory, we like to do these occlusion testing awake so we can actually do a neurological examination every five minutes for about 30 minutes to make sure that there's no uh, deficit in speech or, or motor examination. Uh, and then we usually follow it up with a, uh, uh, with a spec study, um, and that gives us a very good idea uh, about how the, if there's any hypoperfusion that's happening in the affected hemisphere. Uh, and then you deflate the angiogram, you do a control run after that to make sure there is no occlusions or dissections, and then the, the, and the, the test is done, and then the patient can go to the nuclear medicine department for a spec study. So between, between your angiographic pictures, uh, neurological examination, and spec study, if the patient passes all three, there's a pretty good chance that they will really tolerate uh, um, really tolerate the, uh, the occlusion of the carotid artery. So this is just a, 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 a random patient that uh, we did a BTO on. As you can see, uh, the balloon is inflated on the right ICA. You did a left ICA injection, and you can see a pretty robust ACOM. You can see filling of the MCA and the ACA. Now, people can get fooled. Well, they can say, well, the, ICA, the MCA on the left side is pretty you can see it remarkably well, but you don't see it on the right side. This is actually a pretty good sign because all this blood is getting washed out from a different source, which is essentially the PCOM, right? So there's a pretty good collateral supply coming from the vertebral artery, from the PCA to the P1. So this side is being supplied both through the ACOM and the PCA. So just by looking at this picture, I mean, you have to look at the dynamic angiogram, but just by looking at this picture, you can tell that the patient will do uh, reasonably well with carotid occlusion. And so this is what you're trying to see here, right? Obviously, you want to see the the not exactly the intensity of the opacification, but essentially the the uh, the time curve as to how the blood is going and how fast it is coursing uh, through the affected side compared to the non-occluded side. So as you can see, you can see the MCD candela bra. This is maybe one or two frames delayed at most, but nothing terrible. And the venous phase is more or less congruent. So you can tell that this this patient will do reasonably well with uh, um, with balloon occlusion. 
Um, and as I said, you know, when you do the vertebral artery injection, you can see the PCOM, a small PCOM is right here. And uh, uh, on, the, on the lateral, you can also see. And, you know, if there's a good ACOM and with this small PCOM, you can have a pretty good um, su support of that hemisphere. Um, so going back to that patient that I showed you previously a few minutes ago with that pseudoaneurysm. So we did a right-sided injection and here's a balloon that's inflated in the, in the petrous ICA. You can see a faint ghost of it. And when we did the run, I mean, you can see that the MC on the left side shows up beautifully. It's, everything is in phase. Um, and so, yeah, so we ended up coiling that ICA, as you can see right here. There's a big coil mass and that, uh, that stopped his bleeding. Um, so that was, a, that was a good temporizing uh, measure. Obviously, the, the patient did not have a very good eventual outcome, but, you know, that was, that was the, that, that's the problem with the disease that he was having. Um, shifting gears to scalvis tumors, this is what I was talking about. So this is one of our patients, uh, one of my colleague's patient uh, with a young female with a large medial sphenoid meningioma. You know, you can see the typical war-like pattern. The ICA is completely encased in it. Um, and... Uh, we were not uh, involved in the get-go for, for this uh, care of this patient. Uh, typically, I would like to do an angiogram. Um, sometimes, a, you know, you could potentially try to embolize this. But then, the, uh, secondly, I would like to see what the ICA looks like on the angiogram because if the ICA, I mean, you can see here that the ICA is embedded within the tumor. And if the, on the angiogram, if the ICA looks ratty and irregular, then you know that the tumor has invaded the adventitia. And in those cases, I'd be exceedingly careful not to try to do a gross total resection. You want to leave some tumor on the artery itself, uh, because if you try to peel it off the artery, there's a quite likelihood that the artery will just open up on you, and then and then you'll 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 get into the artery, and then you know uh, you have to occlude the ICA, which is not good. Which is exactly what happened here. So we got a call in the middle of the operation that uh, the carotid was injured, and uh, they had gotten uh, control of it by applying some clips but they wanted us to do an intraoperative angiogram. So the next few pictures are of the ICA um, in the OR. So they definitely look a little uh, suboptimal, but just bear with me. So here's the left ICA injection. And you can see the clip, a couple of clips here that the surgeon put to occlude the ICA where the, it was injured while taking the tumor out. And as you can see that the ICA is basically occluded immediately distal to the, distal to the ophthalmic. Um, so at that time, the question was, well, does this patient need like an urgent bypass to replace the flow that has been lost? Uh, but obviously, before you jump into doing such a heroic adventure, uh, you inject the right sided, and then on, you'll see on the right ICA, you can see the ACOM, you can see filling of the A1 and uh, bilateral, uh, bilateral ACA territory. You don't see anything up here because that's the uh, radio opaque uh, Mayfield head holder that occludes your uh, vision. But here you can see that there's definitely some ACOM, but we still don't see the MCA territory. So at this point, we're trying to feel pretty hopeless. We're like, well, this is going to suffer a big stroke. Uh, but hey, guess what? You inject the vertebral artery and the PCOM is, has picked up. So you can see the small PCOM right here, MCA, and then you can see the MCA filling nicely. So believe it or not, that uh, the surgeon ended up actually taking the entire tumor out and she did reasonably okay. She had some speech deficits afterwards, uh, maybe some mild hemiparesis that recovered and she did okay. So sometimes you can get lucky. Um, and sometimes can, you don't. So this is uh, another patient, uh, you know, reasonably sized pituitary macroadenoma, nothing, you know, out of the realm. But uh, if you're trying to do a very aggressive resection, you can get into trouble because the, the, there was some cavernous sinus invasion on the left side. Um, the team was trying to take the tumor out of the cavernous sinus and then suddenly got into a ton of bleeding. Uh, so they packed it away uh, and they brought him down to the angel suite. And as soon as we put him on the table, you can see this is all the, the, the gauze packing within the nose that's trying to tampen out the bleeding. And obviously we did the angiogram and you can see, uh, this is a common crowded artery injection. You saw all the ECA branches and you can see that the ICA is essentially occluded in the cavernous segment. You see some distal reconstitution of the ICA through the external uh, collaterals, through the ophthalmic into the distal ICA, but essentially this is occluded. Did the right-sided injection, you know, amazing collaterals um, uh, through the ACOM, looks pretty good. Uh, so even this patient actually, um, did okay from that standpoint, but because the packing was in there, anytime the ENT team removed the packing, there was torrential bleeding. So we ended up coiling that uh, that segment of the ICE on the left side, and you can see the coil mass there, and the packing is still there. The pack once the packing once this was done, packing was removed after two or three days, and you know there was no more bleeding. But you know again, this is not a this is I don't want you to imagine that this is the norm. Uh, you, uh, pituitary tumors are benign tumors, and you should avoid carotid artery injury at any cost. But if it does happen, uh, that's where you know. 
neuro-oncology and neurovascular surgery can, can join hands to, you know, to at least try to salvage the situation. Uh, but if you have a patient, something like this, uh, as you can see here, this is uh, a BTO happening in the left ICA and the right side injection shows a very miserable, small hypoplastic right A1 with literally, you know, barely any perfusion of the left MCA territory. So you know from the get-go that this patient uh, will not pass the balloon test occlusion. So the question is, what do you do in those situations if you have to sacrifice the, the left-sided carotid? And that's where cerebral revascularization comes in and people talk about bypasses. Again, that's something that's that's probably done in, 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 in a select few centers because um, there's all this debate about high flow versus low flow and the in, use of interposition grafts using radial artery versus saphenous veins, so on and so forth. And they're technically challenging operations. Um, most of the times, if you do these angiograms before, you know, uh, resecting those tumors, you can actually perform your uh, bypasses before resecting the tumor. So if you do end up taking the carotid down, at least you know that the distal MCA uh, territory is being perfused by, you know, by your working uh, bypass. So a lot of times, uh, the few times that I have done these cases, um, both in practice or in fellowship, you just perform the bypass on day one. Um, let the patient cool off for a couple of days, do another angiogram, make sure the bypass is patent and working, and then you go back and and uh, and resect the tumor and include the artery if you have to. But again, it's very important to do a balloon test occlusion before you 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 uh, you know you you undertake this endeavor because it's you know it's a pretty uh, uh, challenging operation and you don't want to uh, you know uh, create a competitive conduit unnecessarily if you don't have to. So bypass surgery, back in the days, people used to, you know, throw out these numbers. Well, if you're taking the ICA down, you can just do a high flow bypass versus a low flow bypass. But Fadi Sharbel, who is a chairman at UIC, uh, essentially revolutionized uh, cerebral revascularization surgery with the advent of his Sharbel microflow probe. And then also with this special uh, flow related uh, quantitative MRI called ANOVA. Uh, that's the software that essentially tells you the flow rate through individual vessels. So as you can see here, the flow in the left arm is 261, 184. So when you're deciding to, let's say, sacrifice the ICA, you can essentially uh, look at your uh, at the flow index or the, uh, the flow through your donor vessel and then decide whether that would be adequate or not. So for instance, the most common donor vessel that's used to do bypasses is a, is a superficial temporal artery. Uh, although it's not a big artery and you would think that, you know, the supply of 60, 70 cc's through the SDA might not be sufficient to uh, replace the flow. Uh, in the MCAs, but sometimes you'll be surprised. So here's just a pictorial depiction out of one of his papers. This is more so for an MCA, fusiform MC aneurysm, but this can easily apply to, to tumor surgery as well. Um, so this is a, a Charbel flow probe. Um, and essentially what you do is you, you, you measure the flow in these vessels through these flow probes. Uh, for instance, here it's, it's, it's 35 and 30 cc's a minute in these two M2s. And then you look at the flow in your uh, SDA. This is a SDA that has been harvested and that's 60. So that's pretty uh, adequate for if you, are, if you were to occlude this MCA right here in order to treat this aneurysm. Um, uh, but however, when you plug the SDA first and you don't occlude the MCA, the, the flow probe tells you that there's only 10 cc's per minute flow through this uh, SDA that you anastomose to the MCA. And the reason is because there's still a competitive flow coming from the MCA. Uh, but once clips are applied and uh, it's proximally occluded, the flow through the SDA picks up and essentially re replaces the flow um, that was there previously. So that's that's the idea. I mean, I don't have a lot of cases to show here because that's that's beyond the scope of this topic. But I think it's a good uh, it's a good uh, skill set to have in your back pocket when it's needed. It's thankfully with 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 advances in neurovascular surgery where you can do flow diversions and and, and, and uh, endovascular coiling and so on and so forth. These cases are done far few in between. Uh, and unfortunately, most of the times, if you're not well prepared, you might be doing a find yourself doing a bypass if um, if you haven't performed a balloon test occlusion or get into an artery that you didn't expect to. Um, very quickly, the role of endovascular uh, in the spinal oncology. Uh, this is a, a patient with uh, uh, I want to say like testicular cancer with these like diffuse meds. The spine surgeons wanted to get. Uh, endovascular uh, embolization at the T7, T8 level. I'm sorry, this is kind of like the video is jumping too much. So they were decided, they were trying to do a corpectomy here. Uh, and what I'm trying to show here is basically you can do a lot of damage uh, if you're not careful. So essentially, and the spinal angiograms can be a little challenging and, and you need a lot of practice to like really get good at them. Uh, but what you don't want to do is you don't want to embolize the pedicles that are giving rise to the arteries of Adam QX. Uh, so like this is a T7 pedicle. And right here, uh, mostly for the trainees here, um, you can see a small 
ASA right here coming off the, so this is a T7 radicular artery. This is a Mickelson catheter right here. This is an AP picture, by the way, so right side, left side. And you can see the ASA right here, pretty dominant. So if, let's say if this artery, even if this was supplying the tumor, uh, embolizing it through this pedicle is exceedingly dangerous because any embolic material that refluxes here will rapidly go into the ASA and the patient is gonna lose all neurological function. So definitely not something that you wanna do. Uh, and then similarly, you know, um, there could be more than one arteries of MQX. So, um, I mean, the artery of MQX is the largest one, but you can still have significant contributions to the ASA through different uh, radicular arteries. So here's another one in the, in the same patient, now at T11, you can see some tumor blush right there, but you can definitely see this hairpin loop vessel that is another contributor to the ASA. Again, that's something that you do not want to try to embolize um, and cause damage. Um, and then, um, we did find a pedicle that we ended up embolizing from the right T12. Just to give you an example, you can see a fair amount of tumor blush to the right T12. And you know we didn't see any um, ASAs coming through it or any significant contribution of ASA through the T12. And so you can you can embolize what you can and, and help out your fellow surgeons. Um, so I think uh, uh, from my standpoint, I'm sorry, I went a little beyond, but uh, quickly talking about future direction, I think we're closing to a time within the next 10, 15 years where everything in neurosurgery would be done either through a catheter or through an electrode. Um, and I think uh, opening the heads or craniotomies for tumor might actually become uh, you know, obsolete, but I, I think there's still time. There's a lot of development that's happening. I'm sure you've, you've all seen the, uh, the advent of stentrode um, uh, in Australia that's basically essentially can be implanted in the superior sinus near the motor cortex and allow people to you know, use their bionic arms to this. Uh, now we're talking about putting these uh, transdural shunts for hydrocephalus. So VP shunts might be, uh, you know, might be obsolete. And then, you know, there's a lot of uh, progress in the field of neurovascular surgery. This is a certain uh, uh, contour uh, that can be used for these wide neck aneurysms that were otherwise clipped. And then, you know, we all, we all know about these laser lasers that are being used in tumor surgery. So I think we're, we're in exciting times. We might see a, a significant shift in the face of neurosurgery as we move along, but um, yeah, but that, I think that progress is gonna be slow. Um, but I want to thank a lot of people here. Um, uh, more specifically, these are my mentors that have, you know, that have enabled me to get to where I am. Uh, so I'm very uh, excited uh, to see what the future holds. But at the same time, I want to hold on to all these mentors that have made all this possible. Um, so with that, I'll end and I'll take any questions.